was in America that the art of flying of heavier than air machines was first developed. The airplane was used for national defense by our land and sea forces. That we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Never before have big loaded bombers been launched in such numbers from a carrier at sea. Deterrence means simply this. Making sure any adversary who thinks about attacking the United States or our allies or our vital interests concludes that the risks to him outweigh any potential gains. Once he understands that, he won't attack. In 1910, a civilian automobile salesman donned a football helmet and made history. Eugene B. Eli took to the air off of an 83-foot-long wooden platform placed on the forward deck of a Navy cruiser, the USS Birmingham. He proved to the world the airplane could successfully be launched from naval vessels. Three months later, he elevated the concept by repeating his daring flight, but this time landing his aircraft on the armored cruiser class, the USS Pennsylvania. Moored in San Francisco Bay, Eli achieved the first successful shipboard landing and became the first aviator to master the amazing feat using three steel hooks attached to the longitudinal frame of the landing gear of his aircraft emblematic of a new breed of aviator that would take seafaring aviation to the next level, he was quoted as saying, that was easy enough. I think the trick could be successfully turned nine times out of 10. Nine months later, while flying an exhibition, Eugene B. Eli was late pulling out of a dive and was killed. He was 25 years old. The United States of America was not the only country who had their eye on the military potential of fusing the newly invented airplane with their naval fleet. The war to end all wars was on the horizon, and by 1914, World War I would be the advent of modern warfare. Although the British Navy was the first to experiment with the carrier during World War I, the war ended before the HMS Argus could be put into action. Both the U.S. and Japanese navies followed suit. In 1922, the U.S. Navy converted the USS Jupiter Proteus-class Collier into America's first aircraft carrier, the USS Langley. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the USS Langley and follow-on carriers the Lexington, Saratoga, and Ranger were laboratories for the birth of modern carrier task force strike battle groups. Unfortunately, the proud first carrier of the United States Navy would not survive the geopolitical storm that was building in the Pacific. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. In communication with Columbia's radio station, KGMB, in Honolulu, we heard here in New York that the Pearl Harbor base had been attacked and anti-aircraft fire was heard. A telephone message to the United Press from Fort Schaefer in Hawaii said that 50 planes attacked the island of Oahu. The planes are officially described so far as unidentified in these messages, although later reports that have come in from the press associations definitely identify at least two of these planes as carrying the emblem of the rising sun. On Sunday morning at 7.48, December 7th, 1941, Imperial Japan stunned the United States and the world by attacking the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The Japanese Navy had positioned 300 miles north of Pearl Harbor with half of their carrier fleet. Japan launched a devastating attack to destroy the United States Pacific Fleet. Between 350 to 400 Japanese aircraft were sent in two waves from six aircraft carriers. All of the American battleships were damaged, along with three cruisers, three destroyers, and an anti-aircraft training ship. In addition, 188 aircraft were destroyed, 
2,403 Americans were killed in the attack and 1,178 were injured. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense, but always will our whole nation. The fact U.S. aircraft carriers had departed Pearl the week prior would prove to be disastrous for the Imperial Japanese Navy. They viewed the United States as a paper tiger and believed if the fleet was destroyed, America would have no way to fight back with only a seven carrier fleet compared to their 12. It would prove to be Japan's fatal mistake. This offensive would not only demonstrate but prove the aircraft carrier was now the ultimate strategic and tactical weapon in warfare. While much of the Pacific fleet lay burning in Pearl Harbor, an audacious retaliatory mission was required. An out-of-the-box thinker, Navy Captain Francis Lowe, who was a submariner, devised an unconventional concept of launching Army Air Corps medium-range bombers off of an aircraft carrier to strike at the heart of the Japanese Empire. He presented Admiral Ernest King, who proposed the idea to Hap Arnold. Chief of the Army Air Forces. Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle was assigned to Army Air Forces headquarters to plan and lead the raid. On April 2nd, 1941, the USS Hornet and Task Force 18 got underway from San Francisco Bay. 16 B-25 Mitchell medium bombers sat on the pitching deck of an aircraft carrier at sea. Their mission, bomb Japan, just four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle took off from the USS Hornet that fateful day. He would lead the most daring raid in the history of aerial combat and would be tackling a feat never contemplated, let alone accomplished. The Japanese people, who'd been assured by their emperor that they were invulnerable to foreign attack, reacted in shock that a country across the Pacific could directly bomb their soil. The heroism of the 80 Avengers who took the fight right to Japan continues to be remembered in the United States Navy. The aerial strike on the capital of Japan confirmed Admiral Yamamoto's suspicions. He knew that since none of the U.S. aircraft carriers had been destroyed, he must now quickly draw them out and eliminate them with overwhelming force at Midway. Two months after the USS Hornet's successful attack on Japanese soil, the Battle of Midway would severely weaken the Japanese Navy by destroying four of the aircraft carriers and most of their combat experienced carrier pilots. With only one US carrier lost at Midway, the war in the Pacific changed direction, and the hunters now had become the hunted. Midway would prove the aircraft carriers supreme and the dominant force in waging war. By 1945, there was no longer any doubt that air power was the most powerful, longest-range weapon ever used at sea. It was the United States Navy carrier fleet and their aircraft that turned the tide of war against Japan and made the great Pacific Island invasions possible. Their supremacy over the Pacific Ocean was critical to defeating Japan and winning the war. The famous World War II quote, if we lose the war in the air, we lose the war, and we lose it quickly, it was proven. It was estimated that since the Navy entered aviation to the present, there are 505 naval aviator aces the majority of them are from the Pacific Theater during World War II. One such ace was the legendary commander, Dean Diz Laird, who was the only Navy ace to have downed both German and Japanese aircraft. When asked, what do you want Americans to remember about the World War II generation? 
Commander Diz Laird said, Oh boy, that's a tough one. Uh, I think that these, these young people, every one of them deserves a Congressional Medal of Honor because they just, they didn't go out there and sit on their butts and wait for somebody to come by and shoot at them. They were out there trying to win the war for the United States and keep the United States the, the greatest country in the world. Sadly, at the age of 102, this icon of naval aviation passed away during the filming of this documentary. By the end of World War II, the aircraft carrier's rise to the quintessential weapon of war had been achieved in only 23 years from its inception. However, new technological advances posed a perplexing problem for the carrier. Aviation was entering an unimaginable transformation, the jet age, and the aircraft carrier would have to revolutionize with it. There was quite a transition in carrier operations from the propeller navy to into the jet era. It wasn't so much in flying the airplane. The airplane would fly pretty much. There was some simplicity to it in that you didn't have torque. And just the airplane has pushing straight ahead. Uh, made it a little easier to fly, especially landing on the ship because um, but well, one, you didn't have to look through the prop and everything or over the side, and you didn't have to use a lot of rudder and skid on the way in. It was just, just easier. But there were changes in that on a uh, prop airplane, going to the flight deck or anywhere around it with all those propellers spinning, was a dangerous thing, and you're walking alongside and between all these airplanes. And in those days, we used to launch from the deck, very few catapult shots, a deck run, we called it. If you were coming up as a substitute for some airplane going down, and you had to find your airplane in a group of 40 airplanes with propellers spinning, it was a pretty dangerous thing. Of course, our crews are doing this all the time. I mean, this is a fantastic uh, challenge for a young man to safely do his job. Well, about the same time, we got to the angle deck, which was a marvelous invention that we borrowed from the British. And uh, it gave us a greater operation capability efficiency, safety, gave us more room to park them. But safety of flight where if you are on a straight deck, you have something go wrong uh, and you have to land ahead of the amount of space allocated for the landing was separated by a barrier and a barricade. These are cables and nylon straps. And the first set was the barricade and it had an operator who operated it of putting it up and putting it down. And it would do it rapidly so that he's watching and if you're landing and you're getting a hook skip or maybe you don't have a hook at all, that this is supposed to stop you. If you know it has to stop you, they will also put up the barricade, which is probably at least 12 feet high and has all these, uh, these uh, nylon straps. And it grabs you almost like a baseball glove. You're going in and all along the wing and everywhere. So it's a kind of a nice, easy uh, stop and doesn't do any damage to the airplane in most cases. Maybe a little metal work. But this you faced on every landing. With the angle deck, you're pointed so that you don't have airplanes refueling and rearming right ahead of you, as in the other case. 
it's off to the side. So if you go around for whatever reason, you on landing, you applied the power so that if something broke your hook or the uh, cables, you had full power and uh, if your head slowed a whole lot, you're back into the air and uh, make another pass. Not uh, possible at all on a straight deck. Well, I think the uh, most significant carrier that I ever served on was the USS Coral Sea because it was really the transition from the older carriers uh, before we got onto the Carl Vinson, you know, the Nimitz class. So it was just very, very exciting, you know, smaller decks, um, easier to get a one wire, unfortunately. Uh, but it was very, very exciting because, uh, uh, you know, you, you got to look at really those carriers that were kind of that transition from World War II uh, into the modern day. Three, two, one. With the Second World War ending in 1945, a new type of war had begun, the Cold War. And by 1949, the United States was astounded to the speed at which the Soviets were able to advance their nuclear weapons development. The Navy found itself in a bureaucratic knife fight over the aircraft carrier and its role in this country's military defense. Fast carrier battle group would once again prove its effective capability in both the nuclear and conventional role. P-2E is a big twin-engine bomber, and we had to make a, a carrier takeoff because it was a war scare. Uh, the Navy only had two two nuclear weapons, and the plan was to put two P-2Es on each carrier's Mediterranean and the North Sea against Russia, 1949. So we made this takeoff in this, in this P2B from uh, Midway. 25 hours in the cockpit. Broke the world's record for distance, but we couldn't tell anybody about it again. After World War II, the nuclear age would define a way out for countries to wage war without annihilating the world. Proxy war. On June 25th, 1950, Korean War would be just the first of many proxy wars to come in the 20th and 21st century. The U.S. aircraft carrier would rise to be the one chess piece that would keep the geopolitical nuclear option in check while keeping regional conflict conventional. While the Korean War raged on for three years, the aircraft carrier was on station flying missions by heroes that would go on to be awarded the Medal of Honor one of which was Thomas Hudner, who selflessly crash-landed his F-4U Corsair in sub-zero temperatures in the mountains surrounding the Chosen Reservoir in an attempt to rescue his fellow aviator and friend, Jesse Brown. Congressional legislation has also been approved to award Royce Williams the Medal of Honor for his incredible mission off the coast of North Korea, which stands today as the most unique U.S. versus Soviet aerial combat in the history of the Cold War. After seven decades, both these carrier stories are finally being told in books and film. In, in 1954, right before I went to China Lake, uh, we stood off the, the Chinese. We put a carrier, two carriers out on e either end of Taiwan to, and, and patrolled. The MiGs, the MiGs were here, we, we were going back and forth, waiting for, for the balloon to go up, you know, the war to start. But they didn't start it, but we stopped them there. The Truman Doctrine, containment of communist expansion, would soon test the United States aircraft carrier's power projection capability and would become the president of the United States' go-to weapon system. Member of the United States Navy, and now as president, I want to express to you our heartfelt appreciation. The United States Navy helps secure the freedom of countries thousands of miles away. Ships which uh, sail hundreds of miles from coasts to far off places preserve the freedom of those countries. We were loaded up to put a flight demonstration on for President Kennedy who was new 
to the office and wanted to see the Navy in action when in fact the loading up wasn't for that at all. It was bringing everything we had for an extended deployment to go to Cuban waters and provide air cover for the Bay of Pigs. Now our particular ship really didn't support the landing, but what we did is we had fighter sweeps over the island thinking that maybe the few MiGs they had there might come up. Fortunately for the MiGs, they never got airborne. There was another carrier at the Bay of Pigs. I can't recall which one, to be honest with you. It wasn't one of uh, the super carriers like the Independence and the Forestall and the Saratoga at the time. But they were loaded with uh, A-4s and um, ADs, which is the prop airplane for those unfamiliar with it. And whether they actually dropped, flew close air support, or were just there to do it, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that there might have been some activity. On October 22, 1962, the ideological proxy war concept had crossed the line, and the Cold War was brought to the brink of going hot. Cuban Missile Crisis. And I didn't personally get involved directly. The squadron that I commanded shortly after that on the Enterprise was directly involved in it. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack. I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. I, I had a friend of mine, Admiral McKenzie, he had the Navy portion of uh, our involvement with the Russians and their preparation to set up a nuclear capability on Cuba, 100 miles away. My involvement was um, going to an, a base for intelligence. They had capability to survey a lot of distance away at sea. And while I was there, I was enthused to see that they were following Soviet ships that were coming from Greenland area on down and right past the coast and on their way to Cuba. This intelligence information was passed on to Task Force 135, so the first nuclear aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, would know what was coming and where to position the fleet to effectively blockade and quarantine the island of Cuba. Six days later, the Soviets blinked first, and diplomacy averted war. But 22 months later, the aircraft carrier would be steaming to the other side of the world. Again brings home to all of us in the United States the importance of the struggle for peace and security in Southeast Asia. Aggression by terror against the, the geopolitical tension between the United States and the Soviet Union continued to elevate as the crisis around the world became a chessboard. And once again, the phrase, where are the carriers, came up. For uh, the carriers, the, the uh, operating point off of Vietnam, there were two of them, Yankee Station and Dixie Station. Dixie was off of South Vietnam. Yankee Station was off of North Vietnam, kind of dividing it up like the nicknames of the fighting forces in the Civil War. And I was a commanding officer of a fighter squadron uh, on the Kitty Hawk, flying F-4s. Yankee Station, typically there were two carriers there, sometimes three. One interesting thing that came up, they really wanted to take out a particular target in Vietnam. And they had problems with that because of the air defenses, et cetera, et cetera. So the Air Wing commander convened a board and said, how are we going to do that, and sent us off. And I, we got together, a couple of us, and said, let's turn this over to a couple junior officers. When I say that, 
I'm talking maybe a guy that's been out there on one deployment before, but he's either a lieutenant junior grade or a lieutenant. Guess what? They came up with a brilliant plan and it was unconstrained by a bunch of us old fogies that had been in the Navy for 10 years. The heavy commitment of carriers to Southeast Asia would continue and last until 1975, where a majority of the first half of the 100 years of the U.S. carrier would be conducted in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. The second half would be conducted on the other side of the globe, the Middle East. When you compare the different missions of each military service, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps clearly emerge as the premier forward deployed crisis management force. Not only can a carrier deter or stabilize a crisis in any part of the world by its mere presence, it also emerged as a foreign policy tool for all of our presidents to use. Hence, the question, where are the carriers, that has been used by a number of our different presidents. Both President Reagan and President Bush 41 had their fair share of where are the carrier moments. Mad dog of the Middle East has a... In 1981, the belligerent leader of Libya, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, proclaimed the territorial waters of his nation extended far out into the international waters of the Mediterranean. He went on to threaten if any U.S. ships or aircraft proceeded south of 32.30 .30 degrees north latitude, a demarcation he labeled the line of death, his forces would attack them. His foolish attempt to go up against a U.S. aircraft carrier failed not once, but again eight years later. In the Mediterranean, and uh, we're about halfway through cruise, um, and we're gonna transit to the east side of the Med, and we're going to do along the way uh, what is called a freedom of navigation exercise. And this was the second time we've done this. And in the Mediterranean, what that means is we're gonna go in and assert our right to be in international waters around Libya. Uh, Libya at the time, if you remember, was not friendly with the U.S. We had shot down two of their airplanes in 81. We had a decade of, uh, of tense relations. In 85, we had bombed them. And this was January the 2nd. And uh, it's about 10 days after the Pan Am 747 had just been brought down by what turned out to be Libyan terrorists. So we plan this mission as we go by Libya. We're going to put ourselves uh, in not only their waters, but you don't think about navigation, but their airspace, uh, what they claimed. And if you remember their line of death and they had different borders that they claimed for national waters. So we plan, we mission plan this as pilots. Uh, that information goes off to Washington, D.C. We wait on JCS approval. Joint Chiefs of Staff approve that. They send it back. It's an exercise in planning so far. And then the Sixth six Fleet Admiral flies on board with his lawyers and his staff, and they brief us on what's going on in the world, what we can expect to see, what we can and can't do, and off we go on this exercise. So in this particular morning, we had a morning planned where if you want to say we're poking the bear just a little bit, maybe, again, we're just asserting our right to be there. We launched a big simulated strike that went off east toward Crete, uh, and at the same time, our fighters flew CAP mission. Now, CAP's Combat Air Patrol. And my particular station that day was uh, south of the carrier, uh, halfway between the carriers and, and about Benghazi, between Libya. And I was there because uh, in this exercise, if, if they launched, if they took this as a threat and launched a threat to the carrier airplanes, we were gonna be in between them and all our assets. Uh, normally, CAP's kind of boring. But uh, this day, we got a call from the E-2 that, hey, and it was code at the time, but we got a call that uh, fighters were coming out of uh, the Benghazi area. Uh, Tobruk is on the map now. And they came north. Uh, we didn't expect that. We immediately vectored south toward the fighters. It's a, it's a long story, uh, but what we expected, they had been coming up and chasing off our burning winds. Burning winds was the spy plane, the EC-135, that was down monitoring what was going on in Libya. And for the past, past couple of weeks, they had chased those aircraft off. So here come the fighters. I can't tell you what their point was, but uh, we expected them to turn around at about 30 miles, and they did not. So from that point on, we executed 
Our tactics that we have briefed and practiced and when they met a criteria, which we call on ROE, rules of engagement, the fighters met that criteria. They were a threat to our aircraft. At that point, we fired missiles and shot them down. The lead fighter shot, but didn't shoot anybody down. And I, at that time, shot the wing fighter down. We merged with those aircraft. And at that point, the, our lead fighter was able to kill the second one. At the end of the engagement, we returned to the carrier. Uh, we completed, we had one more cycle. We completed our freedom of navigation operations down there with no further incident from the Libyans. Uh, I guess once was enough for them. And then the carrier steamed east and uh, we got out of their contested waters and uh, that was the end of that operation, so. My flagship became the Kennedy and in uh, the early 80s, you may recall the barracks was bombed in Beirut and we went in there we uh, orbited off the coast, and of course they had one raid uh, into Lebanon. We lost an airplane, an A-6. A year later, my flagship was the Nimitz. We were in the Mediterranean. I was CTF-60, which is the head of the carrier strike groups in uh, the Med at that time. The crazies hijacked TWA Flight 847 and uh, flew it into Beirut. When uh, we heard that on the radio that they'd been hijacked, I called the captain, it was Gene Connor. I said, Gene, alter course, let's head towards the Eastern Mediterranean because we'll get our orders in a minute. And sure as heck, half hour later, the Nimitz proceed at best speed to offshore Lebanon. Once again, where are the carriers? And we stayed there for a long time, finally got the airplane and the crew and uh, the passengers out of there. One Navy man, and I don't recall his name, unfortunately, was killed and thrown out of the airplane onto the tarmac at Beirut. We were prepared I won't go into what we were really prepared for, but we were prepared. Machine and Mother Nature plays a part and is often more unforgiving. Vice Admiral Slapshot Carter's 2016 carrier arrested landings currently holds the record of the most traps among all active and retired Naval Aviation designators in the United States Navy. So uh, a lot of my most memorable uh, carrier landings were on that World War II built aircraft carrier called the USS Midway. Uh, I was in the last of the Phantom uh, Rios selected to go to VF-161, our sister squadron, VF-151. Uh, and this was in the, uh, the, the winter of uh, 1984. So uh, like December of 84, uh, Northern Sea of Japan, uh, doing a lot of uh, Soviet intercept operations. We had a three carrier battle group uh, around us. We had Carl Vinson on her, I think her first deployment, the Enterprise, interestingly, and USS Midway. Uh, coming back to the ship uh, after we uh, had just got done with the kind of normal operations, uh, the deck really started pitching pretty badly. Uh, I was flying with a Vietnam era pilot named uh, Vance Tolson, a uh, steamer, and steamer went on to command and uh, you know had a great career. Uh, I was a, a young junior officer. I, I don't even know if I had 100 carrier landings. Uh, we went around 12 times that night. We refueled four times. Uh, and every time it was our turn to get in uh, the groove, the deck just went out of cycle. We actually only touched the deck twice prior to our 13th attempt. Uh, Admiral Chuck McGrail, Big Hands McGrail, F-4 Phantom Vietnam uh, war hero, was the captain of the Midway. He broke radio silence came up on the radio, steamer, slap shot, this is your night in the barrel. I know what your fuel state is. Uh, you got really three options. You can fly up the side of the ship and jump out. You can take the barricade or you can make your last attempt to land normally. Uh, back then, you know, we didn't really wear wetsuits. That's a little known secret. The water temperature was probably about 40 degrees. Uh, we didn't think we were gonna stay in the water very long if we went in it. Uh, we had already taken our last drink of uh, uh, gas from Hound Dog McLean, who went on to be a Blue Angel pilot, 
And Hound Dog actually gave us an extra thousand pounds of his own gas. And of course he landed on the first attempt. But now we're up there still going around and now we're on attempt number 13. We've got enough gas for one more landing. And uh, Steamer and I decided that uh, the barricade had never been tested in the F4S Phantom II. So that was probably a bad idea. And if we couldn't land in the wires, what chance we were gonna land in front of the barricade safely? So we made the decision, we're gonna, we're gonna land in the wires. On the 13th attempt, uh, I'll never forget the view. Uh, it looked like we were five stories above the flight deck. We were so high and we knew we couldn't be low, otherwise they'd wave us off. And the steamer made a Stutka dive bomber move into the, into the wires. We were gonna crash the airplane on the flight deck. And uh, amazingly, the deck came down as we were diving down. And we landed so soft, wouldn't have spilled a cup of coffee. And we trapped. Uh, and uh, it was uh, quite eventful. It was the first time I ever had medicinal whiskey at sea. Uh, and it was that night I was told I was gonna go to Top Gun. But really, President Bush had the signature where the carrier moment, and that's when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We tend to all remember the six carrier buildup over a period of six months, and also the commencement of combat operations on January 16, 1991 in Desert Storm. But we sometimes forget that, that, that another carrier was immediately ordered on station to prevent Saddam Hussein from moving any further into Kuwait and also possibly into Saudi Arabia. So in the summer of 1990, August of 1990, the USS Independence, uh, operating with Air Wing 14, were doing a weapons dead off Diego Garcia. So when Saddam invaded, uh, we got notice right away to go best speed to get as close to the Strait of Hormuz as the USS Independence could go. And uh, I, for whatever reason, I got tasked with some major league operational planning right from the get-go. So as we were transiting, and uh, this was on the 3rd of August, we were gonna be on station on the 7th of August. We were gonna be up off the coast of Oman in five days. That's how fast the independence could get up there. We could only take the cruiser and the oiler. And by the time we get up there, we'd already had plans for how to put a probe mission in, uh, how to get a strike package in, uh, how to get refueling from the Air Force tankers that were in the UAE, uh, and to get State Department permission to fly over UAE and Oman from outside of the Gulf, because we just weren't sure if we could get inside the Strait of Hormuz. So on the 9th of August, I flew into Bahrain as a young lieutenant with a whole bunch of you know, really important people. Uh, General Horner was coming in like the next day as the head of the air war. Uh, Schwarzkopf's team was starting to come in. Uh, and we launched a probe on August 10th of 27 airplanes across the Gulf all the way into Iraqi airspace to make sure they saw that there was an aircraft carrier air wing on station. Now, History will show that on the night of August 10th, Saddam amassed uh, over 200,000 troops on the Saudi border. There was absolutely nothing that could stop him. He could have gone in and burned 25, 30% of the Saudi oil fields, and we'll never know why he stopped. But I would tell you it's not a mistake that the carrier air wing with weapons on board flew into Iraqi airspace that afternoon, and that made Saddam Hussein pause. And that's a presence mission without releasing a single weapon. That's the power of the aircraft carrier. And think where we'd be today had he come across that line. Now, we might have done some damage with that one carrier wing. The Air Force was showing up with airplanes. They had no weapons. There were no weapons anywhere. It was one aircraft carrier. So that's you know some of those life lessons uh, that the presence mission of an aircraft carrier is so vital to our national defense. And although Indy was sent home as the uh, other six carriers showed up in theater, she played an integral role in the success of Operation Desert Shield and made it much easier for us who participated in Desert Storm. Uh, we just pulled out of Singapore on the night. I was doing a uh, day to night uh, flight and came and I came back. I landed and the gunner met me at the airplane. He was like, Skipper, Skipper, America's under attack. Uh, so I ran to down to the ready room and saw the second airplane hit the building. We were the first boat on the scene. Our admiral was a CTF uh, 50, had the uh, honor of being the strike lead for that mission. Um, I was in command, VF 213, walked to the flight deck. And as we uh, got to the flight deck, you, uh, you could see the uh, um, cruise missiles breaking the surface all around us, and then and there's a kind of this silent roar comes up on the flight deck as 
you know, because you can't recall those things. So we knew at that point it was a go. And uh, it was probably uh, about a six and a half hour mission into Afghanistan, uh, three elements. Uh, I led the first element to go into Kabul. Sun's going down, moon's coming up. Uh, I can remember the Rio asking me, you know, hey, uh, Biff, what's that out to the right? And uh, it was a beautiful sunrise, uh, green backdrop, white full moon. And I said, it's either the, the moon or uh, the start of World War III. We had deployed right after 9-11, and uh, we were going to engage with some special forces on the ground. Um, so obviously there was no maps in the area, so we kind of directed them to the area they needed to go to. And then uh, they were trying to retrieve some special documents, so they just wanted us to come in and strafe it first. And it was just interesting because you're talking to them on the ground, you can hear fire in the background, you can hear gunshots, and they're just running around trying to do their special mission and get what they needed. And then when they got out of there, we actually came in and dropped bombs as well. Um, it was also the most memorable because it ended up being a nine and a half hour mission. So we went to the tanker several times, we came in, and the fact that we actually were rolling in, uh, strafing the ground, and uh, which is very unusual for the Tomcat. And then uh, after that nine and a half hour mission, we had to come back and land at the boat at night. And I will never forget that the paddles was like, do you remember where you landed? And I'm like, nope. They're like, it's an okay one wire. And I'm like, great, I'll take it. <laughs> The true power projection of a U.S. carrier is the aircraft they launch and recover. The air wing on board the carrier is the spear that projects tactical air power over long distances around the globe. Ultimately, people make all this technological steel effective. The most demanding flying in the world is landing an aircraft on a carrier at night. Throw in bad weather in a pitching deck and it becomes a death-defying moment of sheer terror. This fact has been known for over 50 years. After an extensive study was performed on aircraft carrier aviators during the height of the Vietnam War, to research the physiological impact of combat, pilots were wired up to measure heart and breathing rates throughout their mission. The results were astounding. All of the carrier aviators' blood pressure and pulse rates were higher coming aboard the carrier at night than over the target dodging surface-to-air missiles. If war is hell, landing aboard the carrier at night must be its basement. Luckily, God gave carrier aviation an archangel, the landing signal officer, LSO. We owe a lot, I think, to our landing signal officers. And, and usually they set an example that we want to do that and stand out in the rain, lose the hearing, hear a constant ringing all the time, but it was worth it. One of the things I think that makes a great LSO like Bug Roach is you have to be extremely empathetic. You have to realize, like Teddy Roosevelt said, all the credit goes to the man or woman in these days in the arena. It doesn't belong to the critic doesn't belong to the person that points out how they could have flown a better pass. It goes out to the person out there that's bolted, that's uh, gotten waved off, has gotten uh, freezes up or whatever, and keeps going time and time again. 107 going slightly below on course, call the ball. 32 knots. Just a little attitude to hold it up in the middle for me. Real easy with the nose, normal. Little power back on. Power. Fly it down. Fly it down. Boulder, 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 boulder. Power back on. That's it. Good attitude. You're fine. Fuck, what am I doing wrong? The hardest thing to do is to come back around, get your stuff together, not think about the past behind you. It's like waves breaking behind you. You can't think about that. Going over the falls, it's all behind. Everything's in front of you. Close up. Looking real good. Now start it on down. If we're on glide path there. It's gonna be a real tough transition. Getting all level here. A little back to the left. Can you descend right. there above? Battle's contact. You're working just a little on the high side. Now just gently, gently start down. A little more to the left for your lineup, and you got it squared away. Talk to me, buddy. Talk to me. Yeah, I will. You're looking good. You're looking good. Back to the right now. It's right there on center line. That's looking good. You got it nailed now. Looking real, real good. 
hold it just ever so slightly high. Now, a little attitude. You're jumping the nose out there. A little attitude on. Easy with it. Easy with it. Big deep breaths. Now, back to the left a little. Just a little to the left. A little more power on. A little more power on. You're settling out there. Hold it right up in the center. As you get a little closer, you'll have a ball. Really work the ball. Hold it up in the middle. Need some power on. A little power on. Easy with it now. Easy with it. A little back to the right. Looking good. Now just attitude and a little, just a little power. Just a little. Now land it from there. Just land it. Beautiful. All right. Well, when I started doing this, I had all my hair. And none of it was gray. Thanks, bud. Good job, Orville. Take a big, deep breath. Don't try to taxi for a few seconds until my knees stop shaking. I love you, bud. What's your drink? To say that night recoveries in the Bering Sea were a challenge is a clear understatement, but we had Bug Roach on the platform. I, along with many of my shipmates on these deployments, are alive today because of Bug Roach. He clearly was the legendary LSO of our generation. On the 2nd of October, 1991, while flying adversary in an A-4 off the coast of Southern California, Commander Bug Roach was killed when his engine and injection seat failed. He's honored every year at the Tailhook Association Convention in Nevada. U.S. carrier operations has primarily been focused on Arabian Sea for the last 40 years. With the continued deterioration of U.S.-China relations over Taiwan, the two major regional contingency strategy is more imperative now than ever before. But we were always getting messed with by, in the Gulf, by Iranians, uh, and then uh, in the Western Pacific by the Chinese. And so uh, this one transit, we're going through the Strait of Malacca, do the same thing in the train, cruisers in the front, a couple ships in the back, 25 knots, moving through with this super highway of stuff. Uh, the ship that had Costco on the side, I remember it was a blue-hulled ship, uh, it had Costco on the side, and Costco is the Chinese cargo line. And they do a lot of intel gathering from different kinds of ships. He starts to get underway as we're, we're kind of approaching. Uh, he, he drives out, okay, well, he's going he's to cross the bow, he's going to drive out. And it's a, another cargo ship. Um, drives out, does a U-turn, and then drives in front of me as we're closing, and then stops. And here we are, and there's ships behind us, and there's ships coming this way. And so I have a, a lot of choices. And, and so, so this is Captain I have the con, right full rudder, all ahead flank. And so I turned the ship like this, Nimitz, went around him like this, going the other way. A bunch of yelling on the radio from everybody on the, you know, all the other ships were like, hey, watch out, watch out, watch out. You know, so went around him because I was not going to get stuck here. And as we go by the superstructure of this command ship with these huge long lenses and they're taking pictures of our ship, click, 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 as we go by. And, uh, we got some intel later on that, that there was an attempt to mess with the transit of our strike group through the strait. And I just kind of squirted around and kept going. You know, I think only a fighter pilot would all ahead flank, to, you know, break, break left, shift your rudder, break right, go around them, came out the other side. Okay, was that the right thing to do? I don't know, but we, you know, they're in the wake now. Uh, one, of the, one of the destroyers actually got, got stuck on the other side, you know, dead in the water, waiting until the ships all got away got out of the way there while this guy sat just to be in the way of an, an American convoy. Well, the focus of our discussions today was on Iraq and Syria. ISIL and its ideology also obviously pose a grave threat beyond the region. In recent weeks, we've seen deadly attacks in Tunisia, Kuwait, and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. We see a growing ISIL presence in Libya and attempts to establish footholds across North Africa, the Middle East, the Caucasus, and Southeast Asia. 2014 deployment at George H.W. Bush. I was carrier strike group two. We had CAG-8, Air Wing 8, and Desron 22 embarked. And we were conducting operations in Afghanistan, uh, much like the carrier before us and what we expect to be the carrier after us. We're kind of in a drumbeat of carriers going to conduct those operations. And I got a phone call one night from the 5th Fleet Commander. I need you guys to be in two places at once. And no kidding, it took us 15 minutes to figure out what we needed to do. 
we were conducting operations in Afghanistan, primarily they were doing their runoff elections in the summer of 2014, and they needed us to provide air cover over the polling places where previously there was an awful lot of violence. And so we needed to at least cover that. And then there was this group that was unnamed at the time, we know him now as ISIS, that was coming into Iraq. And so Fazi said, well, I need you to be uh, able to conduct operations in Iraq within 36 to 72 hours. But we also need you to cover the missions in Afghanistan. So we said, okay, we'll cancel the afternoon events. We'll cover the part that's that we need to over the polling and we'll start taking the carrier and shading it a little bit to the west. And we'll launch tankers to recover the offcoming aircraft that were in Afghanistan, catch them on board, we'll skedaddle through the Strait of Hormuz and we'll be ready. And the reason why I say that stood out the most for me because it showcased what carrier strike groups, aircraft carriers and barked air wings can do. The flexibility, the maneuverability, the, the ability to, you know, just project power around the globe at a moment's notice. And so what we did is executed that plan. We launched the tankers, the carrier had already started moving west. We recovered those guys, we did a nighttime transit through the Strait of Hormuz. And 30 hours later, we had armed aircraft over Baghdad. We continued to provide support for personnel on the ground, for displaced, and threatened individuals over in Mosul and on Sinjar Mountain. And we launched the first strikes against ISIS that summer. And then in the fall, we did coalition operations, again, pulling together all of our partner nations and conducted long range strikes into Syria. And I'll tell you, because we're forward and because carrier strike groups are present, all those na partner nations were nations that we did exercises with and flew with and knew. Tactics have evolved, the aircraft have evolved, the ships themselves have evolved. Uh, the way we train and certify has evolved over time. But what remains the same is the importance and the criticality of nuclear powered aircraft carriers and carrier strike groups to our nation's defense. Uh, they're where you need them to be, when you need them, and they bring credible combat power uh, that, when needed, uh, will fight and win. In this and his last letter, Dad wrote, quote, It is a great source of boundless pride and humility to know that an aircraft carrier bearing my name will be forever connected with the valor and patriotic service of men and women of the United States Navy. End quote. So I'm, I'm one of those rare uh, flyers. I mean, I started out in the F-4 Phantom, uh, transitioned to the F-14 Tomcat, and then had the opportunity to fly the Super Hornet for the tail end of my career as an admiral. So I saw these three distinctly different categories of airplanes and then watched uh, from being an air wing operations officer during uh, Southern Watch to being a carrier CO and being an admiral on the Enterprise. And I've seen you know World War II built aircraft carriers of the Midway, to being the second in command on the Harry S. Truman when it was a brand new ship. Uh, the technologies that have changed in aircraft carriers is quite extraordinary. And sometimes we tend to think of looking at the USS Nimitz versus the USS George H.W. Bush, 10 ships in the same line of the Nimitz class and think that they're exactly the same, and they're not. Uh, technology changes dramatically with combat systems, uh, and then, of course, look at the leap in technology jump we've gone to the, the Gerald Ford. So as the third CEO of uh, USS Gerald Al Ford, you know, what does the future of carrier aviation look like? Well, it's on the Ford class. Um, we'll start with the simple stuff, the most prevalent stuff you see when you look at the Ford. It's the uh, location of the island. It's about 140 feet aft as compared to Nimitz class, which gives you a much more space in front of the island to, uh, to put aircraft. For example, you could put four or five Super Hornets more on the deck edge than you could in Nimitz class. You also reduce that use unusable space after the island that you can't get to during flight ops. We also have a slightly bigger flight deck, about a quarter acre bigger, which is a big deal because no need for respots. You can come back, land, trap, chain right there, chain down, maintain, refuel, get back in the airborne with no respot required because the deck is bigger. And last, we have these very unique in-deck uh, flight fueling stations that allow you to um, pull out the hose. There's three of them along the foul line. So the days of pulling that hose from the deck edge across 
the flight deck with two, four or five sailors are replaced by one or two sailors pulling it right up from the flight deck right into the aircraft. So it gives you a very efficient way to get aircraft chained down, maintained, refueled, and reloaded. Uh, we have also um, our weapons magazine configuration is much different than Nimbus class, much more efficient. The days of uh, hauling weapons through the mess decks, remember those days you had to clear out because we're moving bombs through the hangar bay or through the mess decks are gone on floor class. We go right from the magazine, right to an elevator, right to a weapons handling station area, then up to the flight deck. So massively uh, efficient. And all this means for naval aviation is we can get aircraft quicker to the cat and quicker in the air. So, it's, so basically the magazine of the gun is bigger because of the island moving aft, and we can shoot more people on a much faster rate than we could on Nimitz class. So we can shoot and recover aircraft that we haven't designed yet because it all is, it's basically all it is is a, a software change. Nimitz class is limited. Your steam ca uh, powered catapults, and it's a hydraulic system for arrestments. There are max, there are physical limitations. Ford, that's not an issue. We can catch aircraft we haven't designed yet. More potential for future use and, uh, and a great opportunity to kind of expand as the, uh, the threat evolves. This will be the ninth ship to bear the name and its enterprise has been in the Navy since 1775. The history of this namesake is literally the history of the United States Navy. So I'm, I'm Lucas Six. I'm the Vice President of Aircraft Carrier Construction here at New Purdue Shipbuilding. I tell you, I am honored to lead three to 5,000 of the greatest shipbuilders in the world here at New Purdue. So, uh, you know, we have 25,000 strong at the shipyard, three to 5,000 working on new construction aircraft carriers every day. Uh, these are remarkable people. And when we team those up with the 500 plus suppliers and the Navy and our customer, uh, we're a formidable team. I'm telling you, you, uh, you couldn't find a better team. Uh, these guys come to work in the worst of conditions. They come to work in the best of conditions. Uh, you know, you have entry level, you've got 40 year, 50 year shipbuilders down there every day, building the most technologically advanced carriers uh, to ever see the seas. As I look into the future and I look at four class aircraft carriers, I don't see any change in the need for our carriers and our carrier wings for the next hundred years. This carrier and the new ships in the Ford class will expand the ability of our nation to carry out vital missions on the oceans to project American power in distant lands. Hopefully it's power we don't have to use, but if we do, they're in big, big trouble. the carrier strike group, the aircraft carrier, you know, all of the men and women of the United States Navy coming together is, is so critical to the not just national but international profile of what we are as a nation. It represents who we are, the very essence of our hearts. And I think that our hearts need to guide us. Uh, certainly we're going to be prepared for the various, uh, you know, weapons, but it's how we use the aircraft carrier that's ultimately going to be important to us because it is the greatest tool. When we steam into theater, we're ready to go to war. It has been 100 years since the Navy's first aircraft carrier USS Langley steamed. The United States Navy has gone on to christen 66 fleet aircraft carriers. President Theodore Roosevelt once said, speak softly and carry a big stick. History has proved presidents have found the perfect stick. One thing is certain, technology is unstoppable. And in the next hundred years, U.S. carriers are going to be out of this world. <laughs>